Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, Cryptocurrency and Not-for-Profit and Higher Education. We're pleased that you've joined us today. And before we begin, I'm going to play our housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the Slide Deck and Handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today. We'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, we have a couple of great speakers with us today. Uh, Michael Diamond, Assistant Vice President at Hilltop Securities, and Ali Shalak, partner here at Moss Adams. And now I'm going to hand it off to Michael so we can go into a little more in depth on information on himself. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks, Amy. I'm very pleased to be here today. As Amy noted, my name is Michael Diamond. I'm an Assistant Vice President with Hilltop Securities, where I'm, at, I'm part of our Higher Education Public Finance Group. I work in our underwriting and municipal advisory practices, where I, I work with my colleagues to raise debt capital for clients. And I'm also active in our strategic advisory practice, where we advise clients on strategic partnerships. I previously conducted the same work at Prager, Prager & Company. Um, and I'll turn over to, my, to Ali to give an introduction on himself. Hi, everyone. Ali Shalak here. Um, glad you are with us today. I'm an audit partner in uh, with Moss Adams, uh, focused the majority of my time, if not all my time, in the not-for-profit and higher sector. Really glad to be with you all today to um, discuss cryptocurrency. With that said, um, our presentation is broken up into four pieces. Uh, the first is we're going to give you a high-level overview of what cryptocurrency is, how it works, um, and then some touch points that we're seeing in the marketplace. The second um, section will be discussing what happened to FTX. Um, the third will be building off of that discussion, what are some things you'll need to consider and think about through policies, procedures, and strategic planning. And then lastly, um, we're going to be talking about the accounting for um, crypto assets. I'll turn it over to Amy to go through the first polling question. All right, thank you. So the first question is, what is your level of familiarity with blockchain and cryptocurrency? And then your options are none, limited, moderate, or significant. And the polling questions are located right on the slide we're presenting. So if you can't see it, just hit the F5 key to refresh your console. And then to respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and make sure you hit submit. All 
All right, we'll do a few more seconds here. All right, here are the results. Great. And, that, you know, the results of, of this is consistent with my expectation. You know, I think a lot of us heard about cryptocurrency either through the news, um, especially during 2022 and um, the beginning of 2023. Uh, for those of you that haven't um, are not as familiar with it, um, don't worry, we'll go through the, um, you know, basic understanding of what crypto assets are and build from there. So with that said, um, what is important to note is that um, cryptocurrency is dependent on um, blockchain technology in order for you to transact in it. Um, transacting it means purchasing, selling, um, trading um, crypto assets. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of how blockchain technology works, but for our purposes here, you could think of blockchain as a ledger. Um, and, and this ledger is created by an architecture who, who sets certain rules. Um, each computer that has the blockchain on their computer or on their iPhone or iPad or whatever it is um, has downloaded or um, downloaded those rules. Um, and once a transaction is initiated on the blockchain, so for example, let's say um, a sale of a crypto asset, a Bitcoin, you know, um, that transaction will be validated across all the nodes, um, which means that if there is a common consensus amongst the nodes, um, that transaction will be approved. Uh, common consensus meaning does that transaction follow the rules that were established by the architecture. If it doesn't follow the rules, then the transaction is then um, voided. Um, so there isn't a central database, um, you know, storing the information, um, which basically means that having these nodes validating um, the transactions, um, the, the, the likelihood of the blockchain being hacked would be remote. Once the transaction has been approved, the link in the chain will be closed, um, and, and you no longer can go back, change that information, manipulate it. It's, it's locked. A hash number is then, um, or a hashtag, I should say, is then established, which is a unique identifier to that transaction, um, similar to a journal entry number. Um, and then if anybody wants to see the transaction on the blockchain, all they would have to do is type in the hashtag, and then they would be able to see it. Um, once, um, once the transaction is closed, another link will then be opened. Um, for another transaction to occur. But with that said, that, that's typically how the blockchain works. Um, if you want to just think about it as a ledger, um, you can. Everybody who, every node could see all the transactions on the blockchain. Now, the blockchain could be a public blockchain, like a Bitcoin, where anybody could have access to it, or it could be a private one where, where only a certain group of individuals would be able to, or a group of individuals will be able to have access to it. Um, blockchain is not only used for crypto assets, but also for um, Walmart has implemented the blockchain technology to trace, um, to be able to trace lettuce, for example, or produce to a specific farm um, and, and back to a specific store. So if there is anything wrong with the produce, um, they would be able to track it to that specific farm. So blockchain technology goes beyond crypto assets, but um, for, for our purposes here and our discussions here, we will be just focusing on it um, for, um, the, in order to transact in um, cryptocurrency. So this slide goes through the top eight different types of crypto assets. I'm just going to talk about a few of them, um, and, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into the rest of them throughout the presentation. Um, first is, um, you know, we're all very familiar with Bitcoin, we're all familiar with XRP, Ethereum. Um, you use these Bitcoins as a payment system so you can buy and sell goods and services. Um, the next one is a stable coin, uh, which basically means it's an asset or a crypto asset that is pegged to a stable asset. What a stable asset could be, it could be gold or, or the price of gold, I should say. It could be a real, real estate, um, it could be 
Most of the time it's a fiat currency to the U.S. dollar, the Japanese yen and things of that nature. And then the, <clears throat> the next item is the non-fungible tokens, NFTs. We have a slide specifically on that that we're going to discuss that in detail. But under each of these categories, there isn't. Um, there is multiple um, different types of crypto assets. Um, you know, just just to take payment currency. Um, you know, there could be thousands of different types of crypto assets being created on a daily basis. So one thing to remember: it's very easy to create crypto assets, um, and the entry into purchasing is easy, but the exit could potentially be difficult. With that said, um, how you hold crypto assets, there's this concept called a wallet. Um, you could think of a wallet as an account, like very similar to a bank account or investment account. Um, the wallet could be hot or cold. Um, a hot wallet means a wallet that is connected to the Internet. Um, so if we think about Coinbase or Robinhood, you set up an account with Coinbase and Robinhood, um, then they will automatically establish a wallet for you. Um, once you put in the, your username and password, you, you would be able to have access to your wallet, and then you would be able to buy and sell crypto assets as, as you deem necessary. The benefit of a hot wallet is it's easy to access, easy to transact in. Um, the, um, the negative aspects of it is the fact that if your username and password is ever hacked, then somebody would have access to your wallet and then be able to trans, um, transact um, illegally. A cold wallet is an off-site or offline storage. So you could think of this as an external hard drive. You could think of it as a thumbnail, um, thumb drive. Um, basically, the wallet sits on, on this um, thumb drive. And then if you wanted to um, transact um, from that wallet, you would have to transfer those assets from the cold wallet to the hot wallet and then be able to sell, um, buy, purchase and sell, um, purchase goods with, with your crypto assets. The benefit of a cold wallet is the fact that it's not connected to the internet, so it's less prone to being hacked. Um, but then it's harder to transact because there is that added set. With each wallet, there's two um, keys associated with it. One's a public key, the other's a private key. Think of the public key as a view only access to your wallet. Um, somebody would be able to view the transactions in your wallet. They wouldn't be able to um, associate a name or a company to the wallet, but they would be able to see um, how many units of a particular cryptocurrency you hold um, view only. But a private key is the opposite. It's basically the keys to the kingdom. Um, anybody who has the private key would be able to um, transfer um, assets out of your wallet and um, or purchase or sale um, crypto assets. So you would want to safeguard your your private key. Um, and and with any type of asset, um, you know, or or investment account or your checking account, what you you would want to consider is segregation of duties. You want to consider who has control over your private key. You want to keep um, strong passwords in mind. Um, and then, you, you know, looking at two-factor authentic authentication. Because remember, with blockchain and specific cryptocurrency, um, the idea is to be anonymous. Um, and, and therefore, um, if, if fraud were to occur or assets were inappropriately um, leaving your wallet, it, it would be very hard to claw, claw that back or claw back the losses. So we want to make sure that we're, we're analyzing the appropriate vendors, we're looking at um, you know access and security when we're thinking about setting up a hot wallet or cold wallet. NFTs are becoming more and more popular in this space. Um, there are you know I think um, if you if you track them, they well one is let, let's define it, but it's basically a unique um, unique something unique um, in which it, it could be a digital art or a digital collectible. The IRS issued um, an announcement recently that they've defined it or treated it as a collectible. The, the most common um, NFT out there is the Bored Ape or the Bored um, Yeah, the Bored Ape. And basically what this Bored Ape is is a picture of the ape that's bored just standing there. Um, and, and, and these pictures or the, these collectibles traded for anywhere between thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
the valuation on NFTs is based on the demand for it. Um, so we've seen significant fluctuations in the valuation. But why this is important is because um, we're, as, as, value is, as the value of some of these NFTs are increasing, we're seeing donations of the NFTs to not-for-profit um, organizations. And then also um, in the higher ed sector, we are seeing um, uh, college athletes uh, slowly moving into that space um, to capitalize on, on, on some of that. Um, so it's just important for us to know that it's out there. The valuation is highly um, volatile, but um, something that is getting more and more traction. I think um, the first tweet from Twitter was, was c considered to be an NFT and then sold on the blockchain. All right, Amy, I think we're on our second polling question. All right, thank you. So the second polling question is, what is the first use for which your organization has adopted cryptocurrency? And your options are philanthropy, investments, tuition or fees, vendor payments, academic mission, or no current use of cryptocurrency? And then just a reminder that if you would like to receive CPE for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. All right, here are the results. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. Um, and these dovetail uh, nicely of what we'll talk about next, which are going to be the touch points of cryptocurrency in not-for-profit organizations and higher education institutions. Um, we'll talk more about that, but these results are consistent with what we'd expect. Now I'll give talk a bit about some of what those touch points are. Um, those polling results showed that most respondents were not currently using cryptocurrency, and I believe the second most common adoption of cryptocurrency was for philanthropy and giving. Um, but that's consistent with, with what we've seen. Um, as far as, as giving, um, you know, crypto offers a new vehicle uh, for uh, philanthropic interest for donors. It is a mechanism for donors with significant capital gains um, to benefit an organization that they're affiliated with. And, you know, also given the still relatively nascent um, uh, nascent nature of crypto. Um, you know, early entrants, individuals who are accepting crypto are playing in a small pond. Um, and so that's, that's a benefit. We have heard of organizations that are accepting crypto for giving. That's really where there's been more uptake. I think the third most common response there was for investments. Um, you know, crypto is still relatively nascent, is growing as an asset class, and there are organizations, not-for-profits, and higher ed institutions that have used their investment pool um, to allocate a portion of crypto and to try to um, share the economics of the returns for crypto. Um, so those polling responses are consistent with what, with what we see in the market and some of those major touch points. Um, for crypto. There's two other major areas where not-for-profits and higher education institutions can touch on crypto and have, um, and that's with for tuition, fees, and vendor payments. There's been very limited uptake there from what we've seen, um, and that's particularly true given some of the recent challenges with crypto that we'll talk about in this next section, particularly with respect to FTX. Um, there are some, there's potential upside from using crypto for tuition fees vendor payments, um, but given some of the challenges in the market, we've seen less uptake there. I want to say a bit more about um, the context of giving in the form of crypto to, to organizations, particularly higher education institutions, which you know, generally have larger investment pools and, and um, large development organizations. So we have seen some significant and high-profile gifts flow to institutions in the form of crypto assets, um, most commonly Bitcoin. And you see those on the screen right here. There's a couple takeaways from this. One is, you know, some of these, the locus of these gifts is um, to some extent in areas where crypto has become um, a, uh, an important industry. So you see some of these institutions uh, localized around California. There's also um, another nexus here, which is that some of these gifts have gone to organizations that have been uh, 
adopting crypto as part of their academic mission via an institute, via uh, a set of courses. And so some of these gifts have been in the form of crypto to support those efforts. Um, in general, there has been more uptake of crypto uh, for that purpose. Um, it's not necessarily widespread, but there has been some high-profile giving. And I think the basis for that, what we've seen as the basis for that, is that you know, conditional on having um, strong policies and procedures to accept crypto for that use case, there there is upside there um, with you know more limited downside as long as it's mitigated. And so that's been uh, in very visible and important early adoption of cryptocurrency um, within not-for-profits and higher education organizations. Next area where there's probably been the um, most significant proliferation of cryptocurrency and more generally blockchain, as Ali was describing, is with respect to the uh, core mission, particularly for higher education institutions, but also more generally for not-for-profits. Um, for higher eds, uh, engage, engagement with crypto has almost come via a very decentralized manner on the part of faculty, um, institutes, or demand for these types of courses from students and constituents who are interested in in learning about crypto and blockchain more generally. Um, these have been cropping, these types of initiatives um, have been cropping up everywhere. They're part of school-based research centers, interdisciplinary institutes across schools and colleges, and in some cases, just individual courses driven by um, a constituent of an institution that sees that as important to the mission. Um, I think it's also consistent with, you know, the still somewhat nascent nature of of um, blockchain and and of crypto, it's you know institutions are dipping their toes in, particularly with respect to their core missions. And in the case of higher education institutions, that is the academic mission. And so you see a proliferation there, followed by additional movement into the space through our functions, such as giving. Um, so this is the area where there has been a lot of growth. Some of that has tapered off, given some of the challenges, but you know, we've seen a lot of growth and we expect to see more. As far as investment portfolios, um, that is also an area where there has been some uptake of crypto. Some of this is behind the scenes and not necessarily as public as giving decisions and as part of um, incorporating crypto and blockchain as part of an academic mission. Um, but there have been some high-profile decisions to adopt investment allocations to crypto as part of an endowment pool or an investment pool. As best we've, been, as best we've seen, those allocations have remained relatively small. Um, and particularly with respect to some of the challenges in crypto that we'll talk about significant, uh, more in the next section, uh, there's been a pullback in that. Um, but this has been an important um, area where institutions have considered whether to incorporate crypto, um, just given the, um, the risk-reward trade-off of it and, and the attention paid to it as, as an asset class. Now, I'll turn it back to Ali to talk about some of um, what has evolved over the last 12 months in crypto, in particular with respect to FTX. Thanks, Michael. Um, but before we get into it, let's just get to our third uh, polling question. Amy? All right, thank you. The third polling question is, has the collapse of FTX impacted your organization's view as to whether to adopt cryptocurrency usage in some form? And your options are not at all, slightly, somewhat, or significantly. And while you respond, for those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. And then we're also sending them out via email tomorrow along with a recording of the webcast. All right, here are the results. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and it seems like the results are pretty much scattered across the board here, um, which, is, which is something I would have expected. Um, I think the more important thing that we're going to be covering here and talking about is, is we're, we're going to be drilling down a little bit to what happened with FTX, but really, um, when, when you're looking at moving into the crypto market or you know accepting crypto assets or 
even investing in crypto assets through through a fund or alternative investment. It's really understanding, you know, who the vendors are, who's the safekeeper, what due diligence has been performed. Because this is a unregulated market, um, because the, it's fairly new, um, fairly new being, you know, um, 10, 15 years old. Um, the, there isn't the things that we're used to seeing with publicly traded companies, with funds, where, where there's a certain due diligence, SOC reports being done. So with that said, I think as organizations, we just need to do a, um, you know, a deeper dive into vendor selections and making sure that we're, we're appropriately assessing each of the vendor providers when it comes to um, crypto assets. So what happened with FTX, so first of all, we'll start with is the history of of FTX, and then we'll go through what happened. But then more importantly here, it's that um, there is a lot of uncompensated risk when it comes to crypto assets, and um, there is it, it is highly volatile, um, which we've seen in 2022. But FTX was created by Sam and Gary back in 2019. In t- mid-2021, it became the third largest exchange um, Basically, it became a platform where people could buy and sell um, um, assets, crypto assets, um, and they had about 134 subs. Um, and they, you know, from a structure standpoint, they were more complex than Lehman Brothers. Um, and, and this is especially important because I think as as they as they were growing and scaling, um, the infrastructure and the controls weren't growing with it um, or be evolving, I should say. But um, We'll, we'll, we'll hear how um, some of the relationships impacted um, or impacted the, the downfall of FTX. And, and what we have also saw was Sam became a celebrity, um, one of the founders. He became a celebrity. Um, you know, he, he had close allies in Washington, D.C. A, a, a lot of celebrities wanted to be associated with FTX, whether it was through um, – as investors or as spokespersons, um, you could see here the value of FTX increased to $32 billion by the end of or in 2022. Um, they purchased the rights, the naming rights to the Miami Heat Arena, which was very odd for a for a company who's been um, in existence for a short period of time, signing a very long-term lease with, with that was also something odd and you wouldn't have typically seen. Um, so, so basically, they were very popular and they were very mainstream, especially with the younger folks who, who primarily invested in um, crypto assets. But to understand how they, um, what, what happened, we need to understand two key relationships here. One was with Binance and the other was with Alameda Research. So Binance um, Purchase was an early investor of FTX. Um, they really came in to support FTX and provide FTX with credibility, more of brothers in arms type of model. Um, but FTX started to grow significantly, and and what was said was Binance saw them as a competitor, and the relationship between FTX and Binance started to deteriorate. Um, and if you look at the news articles out there, or if you just Google it, you'll see what what I'm talking about the deterioration of. Um, the relationship, and it, it, it got so bad to the point where FTX needed financial information from Binance in order to get some regulatory approvals, and Binance um, did not comply. Um, this forced um, Sam and the management of FTX to buy out Binance um, at the $32 billion valuation. So, um, so a lot of liquidity was, was taken out of FTX to buy out Binance. The second relationship was um, with Alameda Research. Alameda Research was created by Sam back in 2017. If, if this was a publicly traded company or if these two were publicly traded or even in a regulator, regulated environment, there would have been an um, ironclad firewall between the two entities and some of the transactions that were happening between the two entities wouldn't have happened. Um, Alameda Research, um, which you'll see in a minute, was in a liquidity crunch, and basically FTX bailed them out um, through lines of credit, providing them with um, customer deposits as collateral for for um, loans, 
or, or just transferring customer deposit accounts to, to Alameda Research for their purposes. So the, the relationship between Alameda's, Alameda Research and FTX was problematic from the start. Um, and, and the relationship between Binance and FTX um, became deteriorated over the years. But what we'll do is we'll put those relationships on hold for a minute and pause there, but talk about what happened at the mac macro level in 2022. So there was the crypto winter of 2022 where we saw um, a lot of the value in the crypto assets just falling, decreasing. Um, and that was due to, you know, the Fed tightening up on the monetary policies, increase in rates, um, investors moving out of the, the riskier investments with crypto and moving into more traditional investments, the equity market or the bond market. Also, we saw a um, few stable coins. I remember stable coins are pegged against a real asset on sales. So one was Terra, Terra USD. Um, and, and what what happened there was there was a um, the algorithm there, there was an issue with the algorithm and it wasn't properly pegging it, uh, calculating or pegging against the, the the fiat currency and once that was discovered uh, Terra became worthless and there was a ripple um, effect across the crypto market of and basically there was a loss of valuation about 60 billion and because that's because mostly because the confidence um, deteriorate amongst the investors. And, and most of these um, blockchain um, and crypto uh, companies were highly leveraged. But, but then when the, when, um, when the value of the crypto assets was decreasing, um, a lot of them were folding or going bankrupt. Um, Sam saw it as an opportunity to bail some of the failing crypto firms out. Um, once again, um, decreasing liquidity out of out of FTX, but then he was trying to also do that to basically soften the the blow to the valuation of cryptocurrency across the market. So so it was it was he had he had good intentions, but then also ultimately it, it was the wrong wrong decision. Um, and very similar to the other crypto firms, um, Alameda was also having issues too. Um, from a liquidity standpoint, um, lenders were, were asking for principal money. Um, some lenders wanted larger um, collateral. Um, and basically, um, FTX gave them about a $10 billion lifeline. That consists of customer accounts or customer funds along with cash and FTT. Um, FTT is basically um, the token that FTX uses. So we, we had all of these um, th these issues arising in 2022, and when, while we were putting the slides together, I was thinking about the best way of, of painting the story, and I thought this timeline would would kind of um, you know be, be appropriate here. But you know what we saw here is on November 2nd, Coinbase published this um, report saying that FTX, um, saying they, they had concerns about the relationship between FTX and Alameda Research. Um, the, they were highly leveraged. Um, FTX was highly leveraged. FTT, their token, um, was volatile. And, and the liquidity in FTX wasn't there. Um, on November 6th, after that report was issued, um, and, and there was an impact to the valuation of FTT, Shortly after November 6, Binance decided to sell all their um, holdings in FTT, um, and that was about 530 million dollars worth, um, which created a run on the bank um, and about 60 mil six, about six billion dollars was being requested to be withdrawn from FTX um, through this liquidity crunch. Um, they paused all withdrawals within 72 hours, um, so there was this run on the bank. They, and, and assets were, were leaving. On November 8th, the, the, only, um, the only way they, they would be able to be bailed out FTX was through Binance purchasing them. But what happened was there was news about U.S. agencies investigating into the mishandling of customer funds. Um, the fact that customer funds were missing um, and, and basically some of those were transferred over to Alameda. 
Um, then immediately the next day after hearing that, Binance, um, Binance uh, decided to um, not go through with the acquisition. November 11th is when um, when FTX filed for bankruptcy with all their subs. Um, so so this, this all took a matter of, you know, a couple of weeks um, for this $32 billion company to basically fail. Um, with, and with that said, you know, it's the, the greater impact, what we saw, um, and, and a lot of this information is through news articles, I should say, um, because um, the funds are not required to report on this or crypto firms aren't required to report out. Um, the information here that we've got was from various articles. But what we, well, based on our research, we noticed that there was 61% of decline of funding in the private equity space to cryptocurrency firms and blockchain technologies from Q4 of 2022 to 2021. Uh, Sequoia Capital lost about $150 million because they were heavily invested in FTX. Various asset management, um, and investor management closed up shop um, because they were, they were all invested in, um, in uh, crypto. Um, certain banks, Basically, went bankrupt. Silvergate um, Signature Bank. Um, they they basically closed their doors because they were they were heavily invested in in the crypto market, or they had a lot of customers who were heavily invested in the crypto market. SVB Silicon Valley Bank did not go belly up um, because of their exposure in the crypto market, but they also did have some exposure there. So once again, there is this greater impact um, that we saw because of the failure of FTX. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to um, Michael to take us through policies and items you should consider, you know, if, if you're going to be moving into the space. Excellent. Thanks, Ellie. And so now you've heard about some of those challenges in the market. So now we'll talk about what you do in response. Uh, no institution can control the macro environment and what has happened in the market, um, but we'll talk about some best, practice, you know, pra best practices and what we've seen. And I believe we have our next polling question next. Uh, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Yes, so our last polling question is, what is the most significant barrier to the usage of cryptocurrency at your institution? And then your options are knowledge level, regulatory risk, uh, market manipulation risk, difficult to exit, or overall market tone. And then also, you do have the option to submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A window. And uh, we have seen a lot already coming through. And we do have a lot of content to cover today. So if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, uh, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. Okay, we'll do a few more seconds. All right, Michael, here are the results. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone, for these results. And these look consistent with what we are, what we're about to show you and what we've seen. Uh, knowledge level being the uh, sort of first, first runner here for uh, the most significant barrier to usage of crypto and institutions followed by regulatory risk at the overall market tone. So what you're seeing here um, is, you know, the results of the survey that Moss Adams and Hilltop came together to do of clients and organizations about a year ago. There is, you know, crypto is still relatively nascent. There's a lot of individual, a lot of organizations without uh, deep knowledge around crypto and blockchain. And so given that paucity of data, a year or so ago, Moss Adams and Hilltop came together to conduct a survey of not-for-profits and higher ed organizations to understand what organizations are doing with respect to crypto. How are they adopting it? And what are the barriers to adoption uh, for organizations that are not using crypto? And you're seeing the results. Uh, on the right-hand side, you're seeing that most institutions have not considered crypto, and those that have considered it in some form, uh, primarily, generally, they're not accepting crypto. Um, so in general, we found very limited consideration and adoption of crypto. And while that may be the, um, the optimal answer for any one organization, it's not necessarily the optimal answer, not necessarily the optimal choice. Um, 
So we wanted to understand what the best practices were and what, what folks are doing in this space. You'll see the reasons survey respondents indicated they have not accepted crypto. Similar to the poll just a moment ago, knowledge level was one of those primary reasons, uh, followed by regulatory risk and manipulation of the market, overall market tone, uh, very similar. Um, so we saw that just um, the complexity of the market and, and some of the uh, nascent nature of it has caused institutions to not necessarily engage um, with crypto. And similarly, we asked uh, what would need to change uh, for institutions to consider crypto and accept it in some form or to adopt it in some form in their institution, in, in, in any form. What we saw was uh, essentially increased knowledge of crypto among the organizations we surveyed uh, was the, the front runner there, followed by um, things that speak to risk mitigation, improved regulatory guidance, uh, peers uh, successfully accepting crypto. Um, and, and essentially, you know, what, what we observed here was it's, it's comfort with crypto via knowledge and via uh, risk mitigation and, and peers um, having accepted crypto. And I think these, these results dovetail nicely with what we saw in that poll a moment ago, that you know, increased knowledge of crypto, increased risk mitigation via regulatory guidance are helpful um, for accepting crypto and, and considering it for an organization. So our poll was conducted about last year, and we want to talk. Uh, we've talked about FTX. We want to talk now about you know what has going, what has gone on in the market since then. Um, and in general, what we've seen is you know there has been a pullback and challenges in crypto markets generally, um, out of the events of FTX, and more generally um, out of other events in the market. And our view is that this has likely led to a slippage in crypto adoption and less a consideration of whether to adopt crypto in some form in organization. You'll see on the right-hand side of the screen a chart here showing uh, first-time interactions of crypto against Bitcoin price. And what you see here is, to some extent, a euphoric effect. As crypto has been in the news, been um, uh, significantly grown in value, people have rushed in, um, either in the form of you know, philanthropy, in the form of investment pools. And that makes sense. That's, that's been true for many asset classes throughout history. And so, um, you know, given the events of the last 12 to 18 months, given the challenges with FTX that Ali described, you know, we think that there has likely been significant slippage in crypto adoption and in organizations considering whether to consider crypto for their organization. In addition to some of the challenge, some of the very tangible challenges in the market uh, for cryptocurrencies, there's also been a shift in how people have viewed um, crypto. So, you know, conditional on, on organizations not having a ton of knowledge about crypto, which is, I think, some of what we've seen just given the nascency of the asset class, the market tone with respect to crypto has shifted. So you see on the right um, uh, survey results from how many households have some ownership of crypto. There is a paucity of data um, for cryptocurrency, and so it's not perfect as far as results, but you know, we think it shows some of the challenges in the market. And as there has been more volatility and more turmoil, that has led individuals to pull back on their crypto exposure. And not-for-profits and higher ed organizations um, are likely to have followed suit, particularly given the importance of reputation and the importance of, of the brand of those organizations. Um, that leads to some risk aversion, likely to some pullback in, uh, in what we've seen as far as adoption of crypto. So our survey results um, showing last year, you know, a, a slight uptake in crypto, we think that has pulled back some. And so now what we want to talk about is given some of those challenges, what do you do now um, given those challenges in crypto? How do, you, how do you respond to that? As I said, no organization can control some of those external market challenges. However, they can, they can um, determine how they respond to those and how they consider crypto within their organization as a result. And so we think that the challenges speak to the need to more formally and strategically consider um, how an organization should consider crypto. So some of the challenges might lead to a default no, given the um, 
given the high-profile uh, struggles uh, with FTX, given the high-profile struggles with crypto, but the um, that's not necessarily the the right decision for all organizations. There's no one-size-fits-all um, decision that should that all all organizations should make. And so, we think that this calls for uh, a more formal consideration and more formal uh, policy around how to consider crypto, and that also addresses some of the challenge subjects, specifically limited knowledge, um, knowledge of the underlying technology, the key risks, regulatory guidance. The act of coming together to build a policy helps address that and helps bring, or- bring an organization together to develop that knowledge. So as I said, um, as we observed in our survey results, uh, many organizations have decided that they should not be considering crypto, given the challenges, given the um, nascent nature of it, and given the more risky nature of crypto. But our view is that the decision to reject, reject crypto should be deliberate. Um, so even um, traditional organizations deciding, no, we don't want to accept crypto, we don't want to adopt it in some form, it makes sense to consider that in a more strategic and formal sense given that there's not a one-size-fits-all decision with respect to crypto. And this is particularly true for not-for-profits in higher education. Given the decentralized nature of those organizations, very, it's very often the case that um, a part of an organization or an individual of an organization will see a use case for cryptocurrency. And so coming together as an organization and formally decided formally deciding and drafting a framework for how to think about cryptocurrency helps set a framework for how to, how to respond to and how to make decisions with respect to crypto. There's also the byproducts of developing a policy, which are that it helps foster internal communication, it helps unify institutions around how they should proceed, it helps mitigate risk conditional on choosing to accept crypto or conditional on choosing to engage with it in some form. In the sense that it brings all the stakeholders together to think about what are our policies and procedures, what are our practices with respect to crypto. And it also applies a long-term approach um, to crypto. So um, it's very easy to make decisions on an ad hoc basis um, in response to challenges such as those that we described with respect with FTX. But coming together to create a policy and to very formally consider where to adopt crypto allows the organizations to have a framework during those periods of turmoil and to decide how to respond using that framework. I want to talk now about what some key components of a policy um, and what those should look like and how institutions should set up or can set up a framework. Some of those areas that we touched on are those touch points for cryptocurrency, so areas for consideration for higher ed organizations' tuition and for not for profits more generally, fees and other sources of revenue. As we saw, philanthropy and giving um, are important uh, mechanisms through which not for profits and universities and colleges have engaged with crypto and where to accept crypto in some form for the purposes of development. Um, Investment pools and endowment allocations are another area for consideration. Um, Ali gave an overview of some of the currency types. And it's important to understand for an organization what types of currencies, cryptocurrencies, are acceptable to that organization. The operational components are also important to consider, particularly with respect to liquidation procedures. What we saw in our survey results were that most organizations were that had policies around crypto had uh, policies to liquidate upon receipt of crypto to mitigate that risk. And that's not necessarily the right decision for all organizations, but it's one decision that um, many organizations in our survey um, made. And so that's an important component of any policy, determining how an organization should um, treat crypto once received, how it, they should handle it. And then third-party partners and vendors. Um, organizations will have to engage in contract with outside parties in order to, to manage crypto and hold it. And so understanding how you want it and who you want to contract with is important. Ali described cold and hot wallets, for example. And understanding that ahead of time to mitigate risk conditional on an organization's decision with respect to crypto. 
you know, any organization, as, as I mentioned, um, the approach with respect to it, with respect to crypto, is a function of the institution's mission and risk tolerance. So, the the challenges in the market have led certainly many organizations to decide that they won't want to engage with crypto. But um, there, are, it's not a one size fits all decision. Um, and any organization might feel that there might be some engagement that makes sense for them. So each institution has a different risk tolerance, and that can be informed by their mission, their history, their constituents, the knowledge, um, of, crypt- knowledge of crypto among the board, um, among the senior leadership and senior administration of an organization. And so that's really going to inform an institution's decision. That's going to inform how a policy should be crafted and what should be contained within there. As far as how to create a policy and how to think about that, um, it's important to have an internal working group and come together as a come bring up several offices together. What we saw in our survey results was that the finance office was typically taking the lead among uh, institutions that did formally consider whether to whether or not to adopt crypto. But it was also advancement the investment office, um, and sometimes other offices such as missions that weren't involved in um, an internal working group to determine a policy. The internal working group should decide on key policy points, um, how, for example, crypto fits in with institutions' mission, what the upside, uh, what is the upside of adopting crypto, and what are the risks, um, what are the key policy guidelines and thresholds, what types of cryptocurrency. And that working group should, deter- should recommend those policy points to the president or the board or the other leadership within an organization. And then, you know, there also must be, it's important that there's a mechanism for benchmarking and updating a policy that's be sufficiently flexible and loose, um, such that it can adapt with the times, such as with the market turmoil we have seen in crypto. Um, particularly with respect to peers and their adoption of crypto, we saw that peer adoption, successful peer adoption, was an important mechanism for, was an important determinant of where institutions themselves would consider whether or not to accept crypto. And so policy should have sufficient uh, flexibility and looseness to adapt with respect to external market circumstances such as that. And now I'll hand it back to Ali for some final comments on accounting considerations for crypto. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go through the, um, the slide pretty quickly because FASB is going to change the um, the how we account for um, crypto assets. Uh, they um, there is a proposed ASU out there, and I think the comment period is um, is closed. Um, but anyways, under current GAAP, um, you know, if you've received a digital asset um, as a form of contribution, or um, you would recognize that fair value at the date of gift, um, so just like any other contribution that you you would receive in normal instances, um, so we would follow topic 958-605. And once again, for valuation purposes, it all depends on you know how how easy those value how to get those values. If you're using a third party um, administrator like Giving Block or Coinbase, typically they'll tell you what the value is. Um, but if you've set up your own um, wallet, you know you'll determine you'll need to have a policy in determining how to determine when um, how fair value is calculated. There are multiple platforms and exchanges. Um, and keep in mind that the you could trade um, crypto assets um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's not like the stock market where you can only trade certain days and certain hours. Um, so you'll need to create a policy of, you know, at what point in time will you value the crypto assets and what exchanges you'll be using. Um, so having your own wallet and um, receiving crypto assets is probably – a little bit more difficult when it comes to fair value and accounting for crypto assets, but if you have uh, third-party vendors helping you with that, it will just make your lives a little bit easier. So um, once you've received the, um, the crypto asset, day one accounting would be fair value. Day two accounting, you would hold it at, as an intangible asset, um, which would basically be at cost. Um, you wouldn't um, increase the value of the asset, the fair value of the um, crypto um, increase. However, if there is an impairment, which basically means if the price 
of a unit falls below your carrying value, you would have to record an impairment or a loss. You wouldn't be able to write up the asset um, and any, you wouldn't be able to write up the asset at that point in time when there is an impairment. But when you do sell the asset, um, you would, if for more than your carrying value, you would record a gain. But once again, this is going to all change um, once the, um, the ASU is um, implemented or effective, I should say. So uh, as I mentioned, um, the FASB has issued um, the uh, proposed ASU. The comment period uh, just ended. Um, they received a number of comments, um, and they're going to go back and revisit the proposed and see if, they sh if anything should sh change um, before they issue the, um, the standard. And what the standard basically says is that you would actually hold the crypto asset at fair value. So you would, you would adopt fair value accounting. So um, the, the idea of holding it at cost or the intangible is, is thrown out the door. Um, and there's certain, um, in order for, for your asset to apply, there's certain criteria which are listed on the slide. And if, if you, the crypto asset is in within scope, you would follow the proposed guidance. So as I mentioned, you would record, you would hold that fair value, um, and then any commissions, transaction fees, any fees associated with the expense as incurred. So if we're holding that fair value, it would mean that there's a there's a question out there whether it would be subject to the fair value hierarchy table, and more importantly, would this be considered a level one, two, or three investment, uh, and then how that would be classified. I think that's still up for debate, and I believe that there's going to probably be a little bit more clarity and guidance around it, but those are some of the questions that are being asked. Um, so keep in mind, um, I know the proposed ASU is on the FASB website for you all. Um, for, for you to review if you if you like, um, but just keep in mind that they're going to go to this fair value approach um, coming up um, once it's effective. With that said, that um, concludes our presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Amy. All right. Well, thank you, Michael and Ali, for a great presentation today. And then to our audience, if you have further questions or comments, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to continue this conversation. You can drop a note in the Q&A window or reach out to our presenters directly. Their contact information is in your console. And if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. And finally, here is a link uh, to a survey for today's presentation. Your feedback is appreciated so we can make the most out of your time with us. And thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone.